We're going to raid this barbarian camp and get 150 gold. And can we do it again? Oh, oh, can, can we do that again? Oh dear. What if we did it again? Oh, and again, and again. Oh, and we now have the most money in the game. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. I'm the Spiffing Brit, and today we're playing Sid Meier's Civilization VI Gathering Storm. Oh my goodness, it's fantastic to be back. And what are we doing today? Well, we're going to be having quite possibly one of the strangest games of Civ VI which has ever occurred. We're going to be seeing just how much money you can actually make using fantastic exploits and perfectly balancing this game into oblivion. So naturally, of course, ladies and gentlemen, make sure you sat back, relax, you have a nice warm cup of tea at hand, and heck, if you're feeling absolutely incredible, you can even like this video like an amazing human being would do. So let's dive into a brand new single player game. Now, when it comes to who we're playing today, we want to play a leader who's able to generate huge amounts of cash. Now, if you have one single brain cell and have either read a history book or played a game of Civ 6 before, you're going to be saying, hey, we should play Mansa Musa. This man generates gold like nobody's business. He's truly incredible when it comes to regular gold generation. This man in history was so wealthy, in fact, that whenever he went to a foreign country, he pretty much crashed its entire economy just because he had so much gold. This man is a walking financial disaster because of how rich he is. Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, and Elon Musk have absolutely nothing on this man and his insane wealth. However, we're not going going to be playing him. Instead, we're going to be playing the majestic Suleiman the Magnificent of the Ottoman Empire. This boy is incredible. You might be looking at him and thinking, hang on a second, there's no modifiers here that are going to give you more money, but that's where you're wrong. This bad boy is insane. We can slap the roof of this bad boy and trust me, you have no idea how much gold this boy can fit inside of him. So of course we're going to be playing as the Ottomans, and don't worry, I'll show off the exploit as to why we're playing as them very shortly. But of course, in this glorious world, which we're going to be starting in, which will be a marathon game actually starting in the renaissance era we need to be playing against some high octane rivals i want to be playing against the strongest deadliest fightiest enemy leaders out there so who are we playing against today ladies and gentlemen we're going to be playing off against gandhi 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 and john trust me they might not look like much but these bad boys wow they can pack a punch and they all love nuclear weapons <laughs> right well without further ado ladies and gentlemen it's time for us to throw ourselves into the game. This is going to be absolutely incredible. So let's find out where we start. Well, I think we found our starting position, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so because we start in the Renaissance era, we're in a pretty fun situation where we get to start with two settlers, two skirmishers, and a crossbowman. Uh, and we've spawned on what I can only describe as Crab Island. If we were to settle a city right here, we'd be able to have six crabs all in range of this one location. Oh, this is incredible. I mean, we just have to settle the crab city. I mean, screw the banana resource. We don't need the banana resource. We just care about crabs. Right, now we're going to go out into the wider world and also scout it and try and find a good second position for our next city. Now, by starting in the Renaissance era, everyone starts with all previous civics and technologies research. This is very important for us because it means we've technically researched the Barbary Corsair, ladies and gentlemen, one of the Ottoman Empire's unique units. This is the source of infinite wealth. It might just appear to be one boaty boy, but this single boat is incredible. Unlike normal coastal pillaging boats, this bad boy doesn't use up any movement or actions when it pillages coastal tiles. This might sound very, very powerful, but of course it is limited by the fact that you can only pillage one tile once per turn. You can't sit and farm the same tile over and over again infinitely for infinite gold. That would just be silly. There's no way the developers would include that in the game. No, no. Surely that would be a mistake if they were to ever- oh god, they've done it, haven't they? Now, because we're playing on a slow game speed, it actually takes us ages to build any unit, so consequently, there's a couple of things we want to do. Number one, we want to appoint Ibrahim as a Grand Vizier. This fantastic guy is going to allow us to train the Barbary Corsair even faster. Equally, we're going to want to pick up a government, like Monarchy here. This way we're going to be able to pick up maritime industries, which should allow us to build boats faster. Right, now these are the policies of government we're going for. It's heavily focused on building up a nice early military. Oh my goodness, we've just met Gandhi. Oh no, look at him, he's ready for war, he's in his fight stance, he's got his palms crossed, he's ready to pummel us into the ground, but nonetheless, we're going to play kind with them. Hopefully, they're going to not immediately fight us to the death, but there we go. We have discovered their one skirmisher. I think this is going to probably be our second spot for cities. It's going to allow us to gain a monopoly on turtles, and it's also nicely well spaced out. We can probably get a third city slammed down here later. There we go. A brand new city. Well, we now have two absolutely fantastic cities, ladies and gentlemen. Money Printer 1, our capital, and Great Britain 2, Electric Boogaloo. These two cities are going to form a 
glorious backbone that will allow us to generate infinite quantities of wealth. Oh, now immediately Gandhi's trying to do some kind of power play here. He's trying to buy all of my nitro resource and diplomatic power just for gold. He's trying to bribe me. Now, bribes famously never work on a British person. They would never accept some form of gold. I mean, he's offering me just under 300 gold. I would I would never accept that. Oh, oh, oh God, Gandhi, what have you made me do? I'm just so money hungry. I'll do anything, Gandhi, for a bit of gold. Oh my goodness, there's an entire new land down here. I didn't realize there was so much space for us to actually grow. We have encountered Delhi, the capital of this Gandhi player, somewhere down here on the south coast, which is nice and exciting for us. We might need to try and forward settle him to stop him getting close to our borders, but for the meantime, we should be okay. Now we have discovered the city-state of Zanzibar, which is absolutely fantastic because we can immediately bribe them and become their suzerain. Oh no, Gandhi is telling us something. There is no shame in deterrence. Having a weapon is very different from actually using it. We have got nuclear Gandhi in this timeline. This man is going to cause the apocalypse. Oh, would you look at that? After a shift in envoy, someone's taken over control of Geneva. I wonder who it could have been. Oh, it was Gandhi. Right, give me back Geneva. I want the additional science. Cheeky sausage. Geneva is mine. Oh, now Gandhi is trying to forward settle us with his city of Srinagar, but don't worry, we will be able to probably get around him and try and block his access to Zanzibar. Oh, and this is fantastic. We found exactly what we're looking for, ladies and gentlemen. This here is a barbarian encampment, but it's a pretty special barbarian encampment because it's on the coastline, ladies and gentlemen. That means this tile here can be coastally raided. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that because it turns out there's oh so much more that you can do with this. Now, we're actually going to try and change around our government here because I realize we've made a mistake and instead of going for a great merchant, we're going to gain plus two great admiral points per turn. Uh, the reasoning is simple. If we're able to get this great admiral here, we're going to be able to get ourselves a privateer instantaneously for free, which is going to be leveled up. This is going to save us a lot of time when it comes to the exploit. Right, we've wrestled control of that barb camp, which is fantastic news for us, as we've now secured ourselves a source of infinite money later down the line, and Hercules is now going to finish off this holy site in one single hit. There we go. Wabam, we're going to have ourselves a religion now. With Hercules' main job now completely over, we can now send him over to just guard this barbarian camp for the rest of the game. He can sit on it and pretty much one-shot anything that comes his direction, so we don't particularly need to worry too much. And fantastic, we're now actually ready to choose ourselves a pantheon. Now there's nothing really too amazing left for us, so we're just going to pick up the incredible bonus of God of the Sea, so that all of these incredible crabs can be put to work. Okay, using a builder, I chopped down a rainforest, and that got us our first Barbary Corsair unit. Now the thing is, at the moment, it's actually useless. We need to level it up before we can actually use it, which is generally why I was kind of sitting around waiting for the Great Admiral to spew itself out into existence, but that's going to take far too long. So instead, we're just going to sail the Barbary Corsair round on over here to the Barbarian Camp and try and grind some levels out of thin air. Uh, we've now met most of the Gandhis in the game, and all of them are basically telling us that they worship some kind of nuclear deterrent. It's of course terrifying for us mere mortals, but I rest assured hoping that Gandhi chooses not to obliterate me for another few turns. Now we have almost made it to the Barbarian Camp, and here we are, look at this, perfect. We're in a prime position now to actually start fighting the Barbarian Camp, so what we're going to do is raid this outpost, and next turn that should summon in a Barbarian unit for us to grind levels on using the Corsair. And there it is, it's a crossbow boy. So we're going to start attacking him and gaining some experience. After a couple of skirmishes, we should be in the money. There we go, we'll be able to strike them again, gain five experience, fantastic stuff. It appears there's another unit hiding in the bush over here, so we're just going to attack that guy as well for even more experience. And we are just one combat away from leveling up now, perfect. And as soon as we level up, that is game, set, and point. Where is this guy going? What? Why are you going towards my other dude? My other dude can kill you, but I don't want him to. I, I want to kill you with my boaty boy. Come back, please. Please come back next turn. I'll even move the boat away so you won't even see him. Just retreat, please. No, oh, he just ran into my guy. Why would you do that? Oh, the AI sometimes. Oh, seeing as I can't immediately find something for us to murder with our boat, we're going to simply have to sit around and wait for the next AI unit to spawn in. Our fantastic, a brand new unit has spawned in, and the game is now over. So here's what's going to happen. We're going to attack this one unit here, uh, immediately do a lot of damage, but most importantly, gain a promotion on our Barbary Corsair. We'll now move in, finish the job, fantastic. Next turn, we will now have infinite money. Uh, we no longer need to actually start spending money building units. Instead, we can just, I don't know, start immediately focusing down wonders. And the reason we're doing this is going to become very clear. Money as we know it is basically completely and utterly over. And here's why. You see, with the addition of the new barbarian camps in the game, the raiding mechanic on barbarian camps has changed. Normally, if 
you walked into a barbarian camp and you were the only unit on it, bam, you immediately raised that guy down to the ground and got some money. Now, however, you have an option. You can raid the clan and gain some gold, but just agitate it and it will spawn a unit next turn, or you can destroy it completely. Now, of course, raiding it gives you money, and money's good, but you can only raid it once every 10 turns. This is where the game is actually wrong. You can raid it more than once every 10 turns, because if you have a Barbary Corsair, you can raid this bad boy as many times as you like. There's just one slight issue. The developers were aware of that, and so if you try and raid using a Barbary Corsair, you get no money. That's right, this is uncoastally raidable, kind of, because what happens when you upgrade your Barbary Corsair with loot? Loot is a simple bonus, plus 50 gold from every coastal raid on standard speed. As we're on Marathon, that's plus 100 gold. Now, we just have to quickly kill this crossbow boy, but next turn you're going to work out why this is now going to be completely and utterly destroyed. Because you see, with that upgrade, our Barbary Corsair here is now able to gain money from raiding. We're going to raid this Barbarian camp and get 150 gold. And can we do it again? Oh. Oh, can, can we do that again? Oh dear. But what if we did it again? Oh. And again. And again. Oh, and we now have the most money in the game. That's right, everyone else in the game now is very poor. Because relatively, money has no actual value. It's just the value we give it. And if someone has infinite money, then money no longer has any value whatsoever. And guess what, ladies and gentlemen? We've just got ourselves infinite money. <laughs> because this Barbary Corsair can raid this Barb Camp as many times as it likes per turn. Because the Corsair's special ability is that it doesn't lose any movement or attacks for doing a raid. But if you have a tile that can be raided an infinite quantity of times per turn, oh, well then you've just got yourself infinite money. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an urgent appeal from the Spiffco charity. We have too much money. Every minute in Spiffco headquarters, millions and millions of gold suddenly appears out of thin air. We can't use this gold. We don't know where to put it, and honestly, it's just too much. You can do your part by liking this video and taking some of that gold away from us. Each like on this video is worth 10,000 gold. Do your part and save us from drowning in our own unimaginable world. Please, help us. Now, immediately we're up to 3,000 gold, which is a good position to be in because it means we can just buy all of these buildings. Do we want a temple? Sure, that's gold. Do you want a work? Shop. Oh, we're gonna need 300 gold for that. Now, 300 gold, that's a good few turns of gold production. Or it's just a couple of clicks on this lovely little barb camp. There we go, and now we can build ourselves a workshop to power level our production. Now, that doesn't seem very fair, but the interesting thing is that this exploit can get even worse, because this is turn 666, and you know what that means. It means we're going to summon the devil himself by creating so much wealth. How are we going to do it? Well, in one simple and easy step. Allow me to introduce to you a macro program. Program. Say hello to Macro Recorder Standard, a nice little piece of software which is pretty interesting. The way this software works is I can basically record a mouse movement on my computer and then repeat it as many times as I like. And you know what? That's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to record the movement of pressing the coastal raid button and then clicking on the barb camp, repeat it as many times as we like, and then I'm going to be leaving my computer running to just see how much money I can actually make. So let the recording begin. What we want to do is move these two objects as close together as possible so that the click speed is actually as fast as possible. Then we're going to press record and it begins. We're going to simply click here, click here, click here, click here, click here, click here, and then repeat. There we go. Now that's all we're going to need. We can simply stop and we now have ourselves a perfect macro. How does this look in practice? Well, it's going to look a little bit terrifying because what we do is we select our Barbary Corsair, press my defined hotkey, and watch as the entire thing repeats itself continuously. Now every time we do this, you'll notice money going up in the top left, and I I'm not even touching my keyboard anymore. The only issue is, this is kinda slow. It's not perfect, and it can be improved. So what are we going to do? Well, what we're going to do is alter the playback speed to actually run at 1,000 times its original intended speed. And we're also going to repeat this recording a 1,000 times. Welcome to my hell, where now as soon as I press the numpad key, chaos is going to happen. The movement of the money transfer is fast, it's speedy, and it is perfect. Look at it go. Within just a few moments, you'll notice we're making thousands and thousands of gold, a process that would normally take turns and turns to do, we are able to do without a turn even ending, just by clicking this camp over and over again. Now, lo and behold, ladies and gentlemen, this is infinite wealth, and I think it's time for a good old proper money-making montage.
And would you look at that, ladies and gentlemen, 1.4 million gold. This is more gold than we would ever need. It is absolutely insane. If you had a game with as many players as possible in Civ 6 and you all sat down, there's a very decent chance you would never make 1.5 million gold. This money is so extreme, it's about my average yearly spending on tea bags. But what if we could go even higher? I mean, what, it's only taken us about half an hour to get here? What about 5 million? It'll take a few hours, but you know what, ladies and gentlemen, we need to go higher. More gold, more game breaking. To 5 million we go. Six and a half hours later. There it is, ladies and gentlemen, 5 million gold. More money than anyone could ever reasonably spend. It's fantastic. Using this money, we could do whatever we liked. We could fill the entire map with units. Every single tile could have its very own crossbowman just sat there loitering around doing nothing. And if you go over to the player cards, you'll notice that we're starting to completely and utterly break the display value. Gandhi only has 665 gold, but it's turn 666, and that means we're breaking the game. Look at how glorious it displays. But ladies and gentlemen, we're halfway there. What happens when you hit 10 million? Well, I'm going to go into the macro builder, and I'm going to set it up so that it should exactly reach 10 million from this point. And I'm going to be leaving my computer running overnight as we calculate this bad boy. So, let's go make some money. Day two. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're back with not quite 10 million gold. As you can see, we have 8,388,608 gold. This is actually the maximum amount of gold you can have in the game. As you can see, we can click on the Corsair, click to Coastly Raid, and the money doesn't go up. This is because this is the maximum quantity of gold that the game can actually even display. If we were to spend some of this gold, let's say 980 of it on this trader, you'll notice it goes down to 8387, and then from this point, we can actually work it back up again. But there you go, this is the maximum cap, the maximum amount of money you are allowed to have in Civ 6. I don't think anyone has ever reached this number before, and yet here it is. We've done it today, ladies and gentlemen, using just one simple floaty boy. Ultimately, who would win? An entire world economy, or one floaty boy with a whole bunch of angry torches, and an empty barbarian stick shack? Of course, the floaty boy is going to destroy any world economy. So you know what, ladies and gentlemen, we've got all of this gold lying around. We might as well do something fun with it. And you know what, we've got a couple of Gandhis here, so I don't see why we shouldn't do a little bit of early border expansion. First, let's just buy ourselves a university using all of this gold. We can also buy ourselves another trader. And also, we've got a whole bunch of great people over here. Great people cost gold, quite a lot of gold, in fact. This great person here, 11,000 gold. This bad boy instantly creates a bombard with one level of promotion. So we buy him, and if we use him up instantly, we get ourselves a bombard. But of course, we're going to need more military units than that. So we should probably also buy ourselves a knight. We can move this crossbowman off the capital and also buy ourselves a Barbary Corsair to attack the coastline here. We could also buy this great admiral to also get a nice upgraded Corsair. You know, we should also probably create a religion. And because we're able to use gold, we're going to be able to get a religion before everyone else in the game. Uh, this is quite powerful because religions can provide great bonuses. Anyway, that's it. Turn 666 is finally over. Let's get these trade routes rolling. Right, our great general here who's going to make us a bombard is going to wander on down south, turn himself into a bombard, which is quite useful considering I don't think anyone else in the game even knows what a bombard is. Immediately, that's taken our military strength up to some incredible levels. Equally, it's time for us to sail the great fleet down south. Sir Francis Drake, in fact, we're going to be able to use him and convert him into a Barbary Corsair. Right, now it's time for us to make a religion. Of course, we are now massively ahead of everyone else when it comes to religion religion making, which is absolutely perfect. So we're going to create ourselves the religion of hyperinflation. We're going to naturally pick up Feed the World for the increased food and housing in our cities. And now in order to make ourselves even more powerful, we're going to do something absolutely insane. We're going to pick up the Crusade bonus, which is usually a religious belief that is hardly ever used in game. The reasoning is simple. It gives combat units plus 10 combat strength when within the borders of foreign cities that follow this religion. Basically, if you're next to a city which is owned by someone else that also follows your belief, then your crossbowmen are effectively going to somehow drop their crossbow and pick up an M16. It's completely and utterly perfectly balanced. The reason most people don't use this card is simple. Pretty much every other faction is going to have a religion, and if they start noticing you converting their city, they're going to start getting rid of your religion. However, remember, look at how far away everyone else is from a great prophet. They're hundreds of turns away. Consequently, we can just do something absolutely insane and start buying ourselves some missionaries. Right, 
you know what, ladies and gentlemen, it's time. We've spread our religion of hyperinflation into two of Gandhi's cities. He is very upset because we denounced him. And you know what? I think it's time that we go to war. So, Gandhi, I'm afraid it's time. We're going to declare a formal war. That's right. It's going to be jazzy. It's going to be majestic. All of the other Gandhis are immediately upset. They don't like the Gandhis being taken away like this. But don't worry. We're going to be using our incredible, perfectly balanced strategy of mega ships of death. You see, these ships have a range strength of 50, unless I put them into the borders, in which case they have a range strength of 60. <laughs> oh, it really is that easy. Anyway, let's wander in and, oh, look at that, a skirmisher. Yeet, he's going to get attacked. <gasps> oh, is that a crossbow boy? It is. Oh, this is going to be very fun. Right, all we need to do is just get into the borders of these cities and then we can start the fun mega attack. Let's do a ranged attack and another ranged attack and then send in the ironclad, baby. Right, ironclad, you can stay here. Perfect. Right, bombard, kill this unit, go. Crossbowman, kill this unit, go. Oh, we can coastally raid this science place as well. There we go. That's given us 477 science. Perfect. Oh, I do love good science raid. Using that, we've managed to jump straight into the lead in terms of science, and we're also tearing down the walls of this city. Perfect. And can we raid it again? Oh, we raided it a second time in that turn. Can we raid it again? Oh, we just raided it yet again. Okay, so we can raid the same tile three times, apparently, in this game mode, and we can still also coastally attack. Perfect. And you know what? Let's buy ourselves a few more units to throw into the battle. I think one more pikeman would be a good idea. And then we're also sending over another boat from this city. This boat can sail up around the southern coast here. Right, we're now destroying this city over here. Meanwhile, our knight is just wandering around, pillaging everywhere. We're going to send this boat up the coastline to the city. We're going to pillage this log place. We're going to attack this crossbow boy. Now, I reckon we're going to actually be able to take this city this turn. And oh, yes, we are. There we go. We're going to bring its walls down and then just march at night into it and we're bam, that city's ours. Oh, perfectly balanced. Are we going to keep this city? Yeah, we might as well keep this city, why not? Right, now time to bombard their city here. This is their second city originally, but with a bombard, there's going to be basically nothing left of it. Would you look at that? They very politely decided to step off of their campus, meaning I can now farm it for science. Said science is going to give us the ability to construct Janissaries. These are really, really powerful units, provided you build them in cities that you didn't actually place yourself, which is soon going to become all of our cities. So we can just buy as many Janissaries as we want. And trust me, these are powerful boys. All right, now let's go send the fleet over and we're going to lay siege to the final capital of Delhi. All right, once again, we'll bombard the city walls. The walls are now gone. We fire over the boats. The boaty boys do their damage. We send in the ironclad and the city is ours. Perfect stuff. Are we going to keep the city? Yeah, we might as well keep the city. But most importantly, we're going to buy ourselves another Janissary. All right, it's time for the bombard brigade to start marching marching onwards as we've got ourselves another city to take, although this one's going to be a little bit more difficult as they decided to successfully build their city in quite an awkward position. Right, our military strength is now up to 1,000 and the Gandhi that we're fighting is down to zero. Uh, we're able to just sail our fleet around and bombard the remaining cities as much as we like with absolutely no retaliation from the enemy. Right, now let us march in the Janissaries and the Horsey Boys. Perfect. Another city falls to the might of my empire. Now, in order to make this a attack even faster. We're just going to buy as many Barbary Corsairs as we can possibly get our hands on and sail them all around to the capital for maximum damage. Oh wow, now all of the AIs in the game are getting very upset and grouchy. Classic AI. Right, now we're just taking out this military encampment here. Not that they actually even have any military units to spawn from this encampment, but mostly just because I enjoy doing a bit of damage. There we go. And also it allows us to farm some experience. Meanwhile, the walls of Delhi are crumbling to our giant majestic bombard unit and we'll start the great pillage of culture and science from the capital of Delhi. All in all, this war has been very profitable because there's a lot of resources that we're not very good at gaining because we haven't built any campuses. We've literally only built one single boaty boy, but that single boaty boy has held up our entire economy. Right, now we're going to once again destroy this camp and we should be able to, yep, firstly raid some gold here and I guess it is pretty much time for us to start attacking this main city. I want some culture there. There we go. We can complete humanism. I want to bombard the main city, send in the Janus and also give me some science. There we go. Oh, I love it when a good old plan comes together. Well, this is going to be it, ladies and gentlemen. The last stand of Delhi. We've surrounded it with more boaty boys than anyone should logically have access to at this time. And we're able just to besiege the entire thing into the ground. With one shot of this bombard and a couple of Janissaries, the city will now fall. And there you have it. Gandhi has been removed. Well, one of Gandhis. There's many Gandhis, in fact. And will now take 
take control of this city. And with that, I'd say it's pretty much safe to assume that we have completely and utterly destroyed Civ 6. The entire game is now ours. We still have 8 million gold in the bank and we have this barbarian camp, uh, where apparently we still have this sign going for the rest of time itself. We still have this barbarian camp which we can farm infinite gold from for the rest of the game. No one is able to stop us from farming that gold. And if our city were to expand and take it into its borders, then don't worry, we can just go up here or find another one. There's millions to find. It really is this easy in order to gain complete and utter total power in Civ 6. And look, all of these other AIs absolutely hate us. They have so many grievances against us, but what if we just gave them a gift of, say, 10 grand? Look at that. Isn't that quite nice? Gandhi likes that. And this Gandhi here is a bit unfriendly towards us, but hey, what if we establish a residence embassy? He's going to accept that, and then if we give him a whole bunch of gold, suddenly he's going to be a good friend with us. Isn't that lovely? And you know, before I go, we might as well do something absolutely hilarious and buy every single great person possible. Let's go. More and more great people. Just spawn them all in at the capital. Come on, we have infinite money. It's going to be nothing. Okay, I've bought all of the remaining great generals in the game, and I'm pretty sure this is now going to completely and utterly break everything. Look at all of these great generals, and what can they all do? Well, they can all do insane things. This guy makes an envoy. This guy gives us a cavalry unit. This guy gives us a warrior monk. This lovely man here is going to give us an entire spec ops unit, which is pretty interesting because we can power drop him in 1614 AD, despite the fact that planes, I'm pretty sure, haven't been invented. This lovely guy here is going to give us a modern anti-tank, which has 80 combat strength because it's technically an anti-cavalry unit. That means that this incredible guy here, for some reason with his really long RPG, is going to be able to evaporate horses like no tomorrow. And Douglas MacArthur here is going to retire and give us one straight up tank. This is just a regular old tank, ladies and gentlemen. It's incredibly powerful and has a huge amount of damage. And we have it in 1614 AD. <laughs> what have I done to you, Civ 6? I'm so sorry. Oh god, I'm so sorry. But there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. This has been How to Break Civilization 6 by generating infinite money. There has been no Civ game quite like this. And hey, if you've enjoyed it, then make sure to give the video a like and hop on down into the comment section. And do your part in breaking the YouTube algorithm by engaging with this video. As always, a massive thank you to each and every one of our amazing channel supporters who pledge money each month to make all of these videos all the more possible. Seriously, thank you very much, you majestic people. And hey, if you sat there wondering what video you'd like to watch next because you're ready to have an incredible YouTube binge with a nice warm cup of tea in hand, then look no further than this one on screen now, hand chosen by myself to be exactly what you're looking for. Anyway, I'll see each and every one of you in the next one. Have an absolutely lovely day, my friends, and goodbye for now.